Disrupt. Adapt. Repeat. You're listening to Pure Reinvention, the podcast for curious people. Welcome to this edition of Pure Reinvention. Misty, how are you today? I'm good, Mike. I'm glad to be here. How are you? Uh, really great, and I'm really excited to have you here as a co-host again, because as we had a chance to talk to Mr. O'Callaghan from the Detroit Metro Convention and Visitors Bureau, he really shared with us some really cool things, didn't he? He did. I loved the interview, and I can't wait for everyone to hear it. What were your uh, your key takeaways from the interview with him? Well, I think what Mike has really taught me is the, about the rich history of Detroit and, and a singular reliance on the automotive industry. And then as we moved into talking about diversity, and we talked about the connectivity that goes with the city of Detroit as a strong part of its future. It really was amazing to me how the transformation of Detroit has gone on. I agree. Well, let's listen in and we'll round back at the end and talk a little more about what we learned. All right. See you then, Misty. I'm very excited today to be spending some time with Michael Callahan. Mike and I have become great friends over the period of time I have been at the Detroit Metro Convention and Visitors Bureau as well as the time spent working with the Michigan Lodging and Tourism Association. Mike has been a long-term board member, and we're very fortunate to capture Mike in a couple of podcasts, one talking about the city of Detroit and one talking about associations. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. We want to spend this first segment of time talking about the city of Detroit. Mike has been a great teacher to me in helping me understand some of the very basic uh, characteristics of Detroit that are very, very important as we also talk about associations. So, Mike, as we have talked about what we want to talk about this morning, one of the ways we thought it would be important to frame the conversation around Detroit was for you to give us a quick history as as you've seen Detroit evolve in the in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Sure. You know, um, so I grew up in Detroit, and I uh, made a choice that after college to leave Detroit, and then I made a choice to come back because of family, and this is where my roots are. But I remember, you know, the Detroit as a, a real young kid in the 50s and 60s being this uh, bustling, um, powerful uh, city of nearly 2 million people. Um, and that, you know, that just drew res- residents. And, and then, you know, some very bad things happened in the kind of late 60s. And uh, there was kind of flight out of the city, out to the suburbs. and. That had already been kind of preordained because of the interstate system, the automotive uh, factor here, shopping centers out in the suburbs. So it became very attractive to leave the city. And um, over time, uh, the city of Detroit went through some very, very difficult times. And a lot of us had dreamed of the day that the city would resurrect. The Renaissance Center was built in um, the mid-70s and opened in in 1977. And as my career has taken me, uh, prior to this, the hotel business, I was one of the opening managers of the then Detroit Plaza Hotel and the Renaissance Center. So I was a part of this renaissance. uh, renaissance. Um, And it didn't really happen. You know, it was a a center that uh, was in downtown, but it really didn't do much, and people continued to leave. I had an attorney ask me one time what the problems in downtown Detroit were, and, and, I, I, and I knew he was second generation, and I asked him, um, you know, where your office is, and he's in Farmington Hills, and I said, but let me ask you, where was your dad's office when your dad had the practice? And he said, the Penobscot building. And I said, you know what, Bob, you're the problem. <laughs> you are the problem, and you're just an example of the problem, because most of us left and didn't come back. Right. You know, fortunately now, people are coming back. Fortunately now, there's some excitement about the city, and there's reason to come back here. And it's just so terribly important that that happen. You know, as we were talking earlier, everything has a life. Not everything has to die. Correct. You know, our bodies, we, we do our 60 or 70 or 80 years if we're fortunate, and then God has a different plan for us. Um, but with cities, if they're able to adapt, if they're able to reinvent, um, it can, and continue to be relevant, um, they'll continue to go on and on and on. And there are great examples of that, particularly over in, in Europe and other parts of, of the world. And you know, in our world, um, this is what's happening here in Detroit. We're reinventing. Mike, I, I want to make sure that if for our listeners, I did I may have failed to give them your title. You are the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at the CVB. So from a leadership standpoint, you are uh, extremely connected to what is happening in the city of Detroit. I remember you <clears throat> excuse me, sharing with me a story about one of the reasons that Detroit 
uh, became fragile was its single dependency on one entity. Can you speak a little bit about what that means, that single dependency? Yeah, and I feel strongly about it, uh, having you know experienced it a couple times. As I said, I left the state and I came back. And when I came back, I had the opportunity to, to run a hotel uh, and um, I had a lot of um, contact with uh, the governor of the state at the time, John Engler. And I remember there was a period of time there where the auto industry went through a downturn. And um, in the city's case and in the state of Michigan's case, we are so heavily dependent and we're so heavily dependent on the auto industry. When things are good, they're great. And when things aren't so good, they're really terrible. So uh, this, we went through this downturn and I remember asking Governor Engler, you know, what's the state doing to kind of find something else? I and mean, there are other businesses. And, you know, we had a conversation. And then lo and behold, 2008 came along and we saw these just terrible things happening with the economy and, you know, the impact on the auto industry. And we were still dependent on this one business for the most part. In the state of Michigan, we were still dependent on the one business, the auto industry. It seems to me that we have finally learned the lesson and that there are new industries being attracted to Michigan and that um, even from the governor's office on down, people are recognizing that you have to do that because uh, everything has its peaks and valleys and the auto industry is retail, regardless of how you cut it. Um, and good times right now, but there will be tougher times and we, and we have to be we have to make sure that we're diverse enough so that one industry or one like can't really have that kind of impact. Sure. That single dependency issue is very interesting when you think about the association world. And of course, as we start to think about ASAE 2015 coming to Detroit and some of the lessons learned that can be very, very important that Detroit has experienced. Mike, you've also then started talking about how in learning about moving away from single dependency and attracting other businesses and how that actually creates new opportunities. Can you spend some time talking about how you've seen uh, this city as it's moved away from the single dependency on the automotive industry to how having multiple opportunities not only is more healthy for the city but in fact leads to the discovery and development of even new things that you hadn't even thought was possible but, but were possible because you had different things you started connecting together. You know, I really got a sense for it uh, as this economic downturn took place in, in 08 and in 09. And, you know, there were a lot of people from the auto industry who uh, got laid off, um, engineers and, and people who had, um, were, were extremely well educated, uh, multiple degrees, et cetera, and, and it came down to, in some cases, a box being put on their desk and being told that their days were done. So we had this, um, this population of very talented people who had been doing all the right things, uh, now all of a sudden uh, looking for jobs, trying to figure out how to pay their mortgages, um, how to feed their families, you know, guys with master's degrees working at Target stocking shelves, you know, and those were real life experiences. So a lot of them had to make the choice to leave. And that was unfortunate, it was tragic because there's this great pool of very intelligent people right here. Somewhere along the way, the word got out to businesses around the United States, don't try to attract them, don't try to get them to sell their homes and, and come out to California or Texas or the East Coast come to Michigan and come to the Detroit area because they're low hanging fruit, they're right there. You don't have to pay for relocation, just bring your business in here. And, and we saw that happening, right? All of a sudden, um, companies like Honda or Hyundai, et cetera, all of a sudden had these tech centers that they developed that right here in Southeastern Michigan. Toyota, Nissan, I mean, you go through the whole, the whole thing. Um, they recognize that the talent pool's here. But along with that, there were other businesses that understood that if a guy's a real good engineer in the auto industry, he's probably going to become a good engineer uh, in the medical field or you know, other businesses that people have a lot of talents. And some of them have uh, come along and, and, and been pretty successful in drawing the talent and kind of balancing things out. 
The point is, that all came about because of necessity. You know, a lot of these things that took place were because people were desperate. Um, you see it in the business world, you see it in the association world. The opportunity for us today, and I hope that with what we are doing with ASAE and what's happening in the city of Detroit, but that opportunity is to preempt those kinds of downturns and to understand that there's opportunity today to diversify and provide opportunity. So if one industry goes and has a difficult time, and again, we know that Which is, is bound to happen. going to happen, that there's balance, you know, and somebody else is going to pick up the slack. Sure. And if I understand correctly, as the, the engineers and, that were available in the automotive industry started to spend more time with the medical profession, they actually had an emerging new opportunity to develop a new technology. A lot of it partnered, a lot of it uh, centered in the city of Detroit, uh, having to do with medical robotics. Mm -hmm. Can you can you kind of share how that even became a a next generation product out of out of a collaboration of, of two industries who had the available time and interest in working with each other? Well, and if you just go two miles up Woodward Avenue from here up to Tech Town, you'll see that where. You know, it's not just um, it's not just the medical stuff, but there's some engineering uh, areas across the board. But you know, specifically to medical for a moment, uh, as I said, you know, you had this this incredible talent pool that was available, and you had a we're all getting older, and you know the <laughs> the um, hospitals and the, and the medical field uh, that's something that has some uh, relevancy and and has some staying power. Um, and as technology comes along, you know, greater things happen. So uh, this is kind of the sky's the limit in, in, in their world. Um, and to take advantage of that, you have to have talented people developing stuff. And those people were, those engineers from the auto industry or, or whatever were available to do just that here in Detroit. So up in Tech Town, again in particular, you saw this uh, real development of multi um, use engineering uh, that's that's come into place. And what I like is your comment, the sky's the limit, where we went from a kind of a single dependency thought process that we're going to live and die by whatever the economy forces upon us. When you have uh, multiple talent available to create new collisions, and we call that the frequency of collision, we all of a sudden have these new opportunities where now you're beginning to describe the sky's the limit instead of, of uh, woe is me, uh, we, ha we have to kind of deal with whatever realities the rest of the world forces on us. And that's a completely different place, completely different place to be. The other area that I want to pursue with you, Mike, that is really, really interesting to me, and it's a, it's a concept you were sharing earlier, is where we look for answers. We sometimes think that the answer is, is somewhere else, and we're always in search of the answer. But you have a very different philosophy about where you look for answers at. Can you give us some thoughts on where you really, truly believe we need to be looking for answers? Well, I think that, uh, you know, in most cases, the answer is within, whether it be in the business model or it be in the association model or even in government. Um, the, if you really think about um, who has the best understanding um, and the best imagination, if you think about who's most likely to be spending their idle time thinking about uh, your company's issues or your association's issues or your city's issues. It's those people who are living with it all the time. And too often, you know, we will reach out to experts who maybe are from another part of the country or another part of the state, when the reality is that the person who really understands how to get out of something that's a mess or maybe how to grow the business or association, or in our case, um, our membership or provide uh, benefits to our membership, are those people who are right here. And, and you know, so unfortunately, we oftentimes discount them. But I would argue that the city of Detroit, for example, and, and the mayor's office and the leadership over there, uh, those people who are working for Mayor Duggan and are working for the city of Detroit and are internal, they, they understand what the real problems are, and, and they're, they're most likely to, to sit in a meeting and come up with something. You know, there's some guy there who's, who's a junior 
executive over in, in the city of Detroit who's living in downtown Detroit and is seeing the activity on Friday and Saturday nights um, and all the positive stuff's going on. And he, that's, that person, he or she, is the one who's probably going to say something that's going to turn the light bulb on. Right, right. And, I, and all of a sudden it's allowed to be okay. It's yeah. allowed to have the answer come with, from within, that the solution doesn't have to always be external. It doesn't mean there isn't value in an external, uh, some, right. something external to assist. But in many cases, the ownership and the solution really lies within. And, and I believe you'll say it also even lies within the individual, that, that no one else can really own whatever your journey is. You have to own that first, and that's the same exact journey with the municipality. You know what? We're all responsible for ourselves, right? At the end of the day, um, it's all about choice. And deep inside of us, you know, we know where we want to go. And in some cases, it's a matter of being brave enough to do it. Good word. Because, you know, there's always risk. But um, we know what the, the stuff should be. It's just a matter of, of making that choice. You, Mike, uh, have had, uh, unbeknownst to you, taught me one of the fundamental characteristics of pure reinvention. And we've added that as step four in our process, which is connection. You started sharing with me early in my investigation of the city of Detroit and what it was going through how Detroit could connect in ways that hadn't even been imagined yet. And, and then understanding whether you're a municipality, a business model, an association, this word called connect and what this word connect really means. Specific to the city of Detroit, can you walk us through your thought process of how that word connect adds tremendous value to the success of the city of Detroit. Or for that matter, for the success of the entire state of Michigan. Great point. You know, um, because in, in Detroit's case, so often I've heard people, particularly out state, saying that, you know, they, they fear that their tax dollars are going down into the city of Detroit. It even takes place a little bit even right now, you know, with the conversations about the water system and so you know we don't want to have our money going down to the city of Detroit and I'm afraid that at times people lose sight of the fact that it is the biggest municipality in the state of Michigan and that what happens here affects everything out state whether it be in Cadillac or Traverse City or Petoskey it affects it and and the other thing is that what feeds Traverse City and Cadillac and Petoskey and Mackinac Island and all these places typically are people from Detroit. But back to the connectivity. You know, this place um, has such a strong, rich tradition, history, um, going back to the early 1900s with the auto industry, going back to World War II with uh, the, the fact that, you know, all of the stuff was produced here in Detroit. It really was the, it really was the root of democracy. Uh, it was not for D Detroit and the people who lived here or worked here. That war would have been lost by the Allies. Um, and even to this day, um, the impact on our country and the free world that comes from here is dramatic. We have uh, one of the largest airports in the United States with, an, inter with uh, an interstate system that can feed the rest of the world. We've across the river one mile from where we're sitting right now, we've got another country. And this city um, and the activities that take place here feed southern Ontario, they feed out to the state of Michigan, out to the rest of the Midwest. And, and, and you know, I remember during the, the downturn, uh, people saying that uh, every ninth job in the United States was around the auto industry. So can you speak a little bit about the attitude that's necessary to really take connection to its really deep value? I want to give an example, and it's uh, specific to ASAE and this convention that's coming to Detroit in August. And I've attended a number of their conventions, and it's an opportunity to entertain meeting planners from all around the United States. Um, and show them what you've got and hopefully convince them that this will, is a great destination for their conventions, right? 
So I've gone to a number of other cities and in some cases recognized that in their particular cases, they kept those delegates who came in for ASE right in their city. There's no promotional information about uh, other parts of their state, no effort to sell to other parts of the state. Very interesting. And uh, when we, we started really working hard this past year on what we were doing, we believed and do believe that it was important to engage the rest of the state of Michigan. Now, not every destination in the state of Michigan is going to attract conventions. Right. They don't have the size to do it. But they, are, they have the opportunity to um, intermingle with people who are of affluence and have some money in some cases, et cetera. So we wanted to, get, we wanted to give opportunity to other destinations in the state of Michigan. And we've invited places like Mackinac Island and you know, Traverse City and Grand Rapids, et cetera, to join with us. Mike, I want to thank you uh, for this wonderful conversation. Mike is, again, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Detroit Metro Convention and Visitors Bureau, and I'm very proud to be able to call Mike O'Callaghan a friend of mine. From all of us at Pure Invention, thank you for listening to this podcast with Mike O'Callaghan. Well, I'm constantly amazed, Misty, as we listen to these key speakers in the city of Detroit, what we have to learn. Don't you agree? I do. I learned so much by just listening to Mike talk. He seems like a guy I could have a beer or a coffee with and, and just learn a lot. Well, I have learned a lot from Mike. We have, have shared both a, a beer and coffee, and what Mike has taught me has been incredible, and I was really pleased to be able to share it with the rest of our listening audience. I, I, I know that this is probably re logical to a lot of people, but really and truly you have to look at the history of something before you can understand how to go forward. And Mike has been very gracious to share with us what the real history of Detroit has been. Misty, what was your, some of your takeaways on the history of Detroit? Uh, well, really just that they've they've been on this ebb and flow process. They started with the auto industry. They relied on the auto industry, and um, they kind of got burned on putting all their eggs in that one basket. And in, even uh, interestingly, before that, Misty, the Detroit River was its kind of the singular focus where all the goods and, and services kind of traveled up through the river and had that singular focus. The whole degree of success with the Detroit area was the Detroit River, and then it shifted to the automotive industry in the second hundred years. And now here we are in the third hundred years where the city has learned a valuable lesson, that, and that is we have to move away from that single uh, focus and start to create some, some real diversity. So an example of diversity that Mike talked about would be, but would be what, Misty? Um, well, back to the auto industry, that, or I'm sorry, moving away from the auto industry and going to, like, the medical field is really growing there. Tech, tech town in Detroit is growing immensely. I read an article recently that said something about Detroit's, like, the new Silicon Valley, and I think it is. The mines are there, the talent pool is there, and businesses are starting to learn that. And what's really amazing is once we see, see how diversity plays a role in future success, where we can change the combinations of elements that go into a successful pattern... Those interesting diversifications are the whole key to our next generation of success. So while we were singular with the Detroit River and we were singular with the automotive industry, this whole area of diversification creates unlimited potential for the city of Detroit or an organization or association to grow once it gets out of its singular focus. That's just what I was going to say, Mike, is what a great lesson for associations to look at the city and see how sometimes you can't be so singularly focused that you're losing your relevancy to your members. Well, it's important to be mission centered in any sort of a focus, we have to understand when we're singular that has some a certain degree of limitations, and it's that diversification which allows us to get to that fourth step in the reinvention step process, which is connect, the ability to connect or reconnect all these different combinations and all these different potentials in so many different ways. It just creates a real dynamic environment, Misty. And Mike's, you know, Mike's comments on the history of Detroit and how we really, Detroit has really be, is a hub for connectivity to the greater world with, with our railways and our interstates and our waterways. And it's incredible when you think about the way everything does move out and it's such a central location and very meaningful to us. When we don't think about whatever our entity is, a city or an association, as the end but only the beginning, we have a completely different perspective on how to grow new business. Misty, it's been again a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Thanks. It's been wonderful. Remember, if you want to change, make it a change that lasts. Make it pure reinvention. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pure Reinvention. Keep the conversation going and get alerts when new podcasts are up by following us on Twitter at Pure Reinvention or sign up for our mailing list at purereinvention.com.